before we get into the show, guys, remember, this podcast posts each and every single Sunday, so if you like that, go check out the channel. Uh, we have tons and tons and tons of past podcasts you can go listen to, including recapping the entire uh, 2018 NFL draft. So if you like this content, please support in any way you can. Uh, this first news story comes from the f- uh, f- guy. I get these two sites mixed up all the time. Uh, the Finn fan sided is what it's called uh and it is recap recapping the first week of training camp so i thought we would go through this really quick uh the okay in fact it's the first season going back to to i believe 2008 that everyone reported healthy to start camp sunday was to be the first day in full pads but that got pushed back to monday due to weather concerns it's possible that gates had health in mind as well when the pads came on the defense dominated which should be expected as that seems to be the makeup of most good units who might feel like they will get the upper edge a few scrums broke out and with danny amadola getting the lion's share of reps from Tannehill, he was on that got into with old foe but now friendly teammate bobby mccain and also minka fitzpatrick who also tangled with jakeen grant who may be on the smaller side but he doesn't play like it the offensive line has been subpar with the defensive line showing them up for at least a few days yesterday a beat writer on social media had concerns over not seeing josh sitton and ted larson was getting first team reps this is a this is a concern and it should be looked into i can't recall the writer's name but i will give credit to all the writers who would gain information on twitter uh, some people have shown concern for mike gusecki early on but when the day for red zone drills came around which also happened to be when AJ Derby missed the day who was getting first team snaps. He started gaining praise for his play with uh, touchdowns and even picking up blitzes uh, to some extent. Yeah, it, if you guys haven't checked it out, please go on to the Dolphins Twitter where Mike Gusecki makes one of the sickest one-handed grabs you've ever seen. Um, and again, w- w- let's finish this article and then we'll get into that. Another concern was over Albert Wilson in the comment Coach Gase made after him not being a slot receiver where he played close to 60% of his snaps with the Chiefs. To this point, Danny Amendola has been playing there in camp and building a rapport with Ryan Tanya, who who has played well so far and only giving up one interception, which is good news. The concern over who will be Amendola's backup is, is the slot is legit as he has been injury p- prone in the past. Coach Gase res- uh, responds was Wilson will play over, which seems nice, but you still have just one player taking most of the snaps in the slot, uh, like we had Jarvis Landry. All right, so that was pretty much recapping it. Mike Gusecki, Lee, you know, I guess iffy outside of red zone drills. Um, and then obviously the offensive line getting dominated. Josh, Josh, Josh Sitton. Um, obviously not participating as much as some people would want, like, um, and Albert Wilson not taking snaps in the slot. And we have a bunch of, bunch of other news that's going to, I guess, ease that, uh, throughout the show with some of our younger players, you know, performing at a high level in camp so far. But concerning this news specifically, uh, the offensive line struggling doesn't surprise me. The defense getting the upper hand on the offense doesn't surprise me and it doesn't worry me unless it stops pretty pretty fairly soon because people forget training camp is not that long the preseason before you know it we're in week one of the regular season and i want to focus on the offense versus the defense in years past the defense whooped our last year they did uh and the year before that they did in training camp they crap and killed us uh, so bad, Adam, Adam Gase was complaining about it. And I, really, since Adam Gase has gotten here, the defense has been whipping up on the offense. Which concerns me a little bit, because it's like, okay, there's a pattern there uh, of older teams. Now, granted, which is weird, because the 2016 team is such a weird, weird one, because the defense was so bad. But, but my point is, it does worry me a little bit uh, if it continues to happen. Uh, but I, I'm not too concerned about it. The reason I'm not is... The last three years in the NFL in general, offenses have started off really, really slow. Like, really, really, really slow. Um, So I'm not super concerned about it. Uh, I think it's more of an NFL issue than it is specifically to our team. If it continues on, then I'm going to be like, okay, hopefully 
you know, we can, we can clean this up sooner or later because it, I mean, it can mean two things. It can mean our defense is really, really good or our offense is not so good. And the fact that the offensive line is what is struggling really concerns me because that was the reason, well, not the reason, but a big reason that of how, why the 2017 team was so bad. So, um, you know, it, it does, you know, I'm not, it's, it doesn't concern me again. Unless it continues to happen, as everybody around me right now, I, I'm recording this. People are screaming. I'm sorry about that, guys, but people are screaming. There's nothing I can do about it. But um, second thing with the uh, Albert Wilson uh, in the slot, we're gonna get into it later in the show. But Isaiah Ford has played very well, uh, very well, and has impressed everybody on the coaching staff so far. So that doesn't concern me because we have so many slot receivers on this team. Like if Danny got hurt. We have a lot of, not only that, but we have a lot of good receivers. I think the concern, I guess, would be, like, who the heck is our X receiver? Like, our outside, I guess Shaquem, he plays better on the outside. But the depth concerns, I think, are more, I'm more concerned about the outside receivers than I would be the slot receivers, is my point. I'm not super concerned about that. If Danny went down, I think we still have a lot of depth at a receiver. So that doesn't concern me um, at all. Uh, and then the third thing with Mike Gusecki, um, you know, kind of if he. But again, you know, what he did best in college was red zone. That's the reason he got drafted so dang high is because he, was su- he had such good touchdown production. And, and at the end of the day, dude, that is something that's so valuable is getting touchdowns. So let's say Mike has 300 yards receiving, but he has like 14 touchdowns. To me, that's a successful rookie season. That doesn't concern me at all. It's, I'm glad to see, you know, NFL uh players say this all the time you always want to draft the player that's really really good at something because early on in their career they can rely on that and be successful and then as the as the years go on and as you know you mature as a player you get better at other things but as long as you're really really good at something and early on uh you'll have a good nfl career and a lot i mean that has been said i don't know how many times but um that's good. I think that's a good sign for Mike Gusecki because the, I, he, the thing that he does really well is probably is the most important thing on offense, which is scoring touchdowns. So that doesn't concern me at all. And again, with the blitz pickups, apparently he looked good on red zone drills uh, when they did red zone drills. Blocking is his biggest issue. And to me, listen, I'm not. I'm. Ne- I will never say, especially in college, that Mike was a great blocker. But I do think people over overstate the fact that he can't block if you watch his ta- I, don't, I don't want to use this word take like i'm some kind of scout but um if you watched him at penn state they did a lot of motions with saquon barkley uh and chase mcsurley mcsurley or whatever i can't remember his name um because they're both athletic people and they can both like he can take the read option you, a lot of motion a lot of misdirection going on in that offense and he was used to block in that running scheme a lot um a lot a lot actually i would say I would even I would go as far to say 65% of this this man's snaps were not only motions but blocking um, on some of these inside zone runs. So I I, I think it's a little overstated. Um, so yeah, I'm not really worried about Mike either. So yeah, I, a lot of good news so far through training camp. The most important like the thing I'm so excited about is Tannehill and I, you know obviously Frank Gore we're gonna get into, but it's really awesome to see Tannehill is impressing people in training camp so far. Um, which is really, really good news. Uh, this next news story comes from um, the Finsider. Uh, are the Dolphins considering trading Devontae Parker? With the 14th overall pick in the 2015 NFL Draft, the Miami Dolphins selected Louisville wide receiver Devontae Parker. The 6'3", 212-pound pound Parker ran a 4 four five forty time he actually ran a four three forty time uh, at one point i can't remember uh 40 yard dash and had a vertical leap of 36.5 inches uh in the build up to the draft giving miami a big bodied number one receiver they needed in the offense except as the team begins f- the fourth year with parker they are still waiting to see the player waiting to see the parker reach his potential dolphins fans have been frustrated with parker's plan for the last couple of years one game he will dominate and he'll look like a great receiver finally hitting his stride and the next he will disappear injuries have plagued him throughout his career whether they're serious or just long-term nagging problems and Devonte parker never seems to be 100 percent now the trade talks among the fans are starting to increase the volume starting to increase in volume there is nothing that says miami is really looking to move from parker they exercise his fifth year option this year keeping him under contract through 2019 though they have the ability to receive 
rescind his fifth year option after the season if Parker does not perform. The problem for Parker, at least in the eyes of the media and fans, is he has been having a quiet training camp. Um, of course, the fact that Xavier Howard, who showed he could be a, a shutdown cornerback near the end of 2017, has been covering Parker throughout the early part of camp and has not let anything anything happen there. Um, I think this is a bunch of baloney. There's not a chance, uh, unless in mid season during the uh, trade line or excuse me the trade deadline. That is the only possibility where I could see Devontae Parker being traded, and not even then because I don't even think that's well. I mean, I well I get well. I mean, I guess that would be smart, but you really can't get a lot, um, you know, mid-season trade deadline. But, but the point is, there's no way that the Dolphins are going to get rid of Devontae Parker at all. There, there's just no way. It's not happening. They've put too much sock in him this offseason. Every coach on, in our organization, whether they're lying or not, has said great things about DP, how they have faith in him, how he just needs to stay healthy, and you'll see how great he actually is, has been said multiple times by Dal Loggins, by Adam Gase, by everybody. So I, I, there's just not a chance, dude. Not a chance um, that he's going to get traded. And we're still, and again, we're still hoping that he can stay healthy and can stay consistent. And now that he's going to be by far the world especially on the outside i'm not gonna say we not like we don't have any talent on this team in terms of the receiving unit but he's by far the most prototypical outside receiver that we have he's the only one that has size um everybody else is pretty short so uh kenny Steele is probably the second tallest receiver on our team um believe it or not so no, there's not a chance Devontae Parker gets traded, and I still have a lot of faith in him. He has so much potential. Uh, the fact that it, you know Xavier Howard's doing so well covering him is, I think, is good news, um, because Devontae Parker in the past has had ridiculously good training camps against the same Xavier Howard and against the same sort, you know, corners for the most part. Obviously, Byron Maxwell is no longer here, but I think that's good news because DP um, usually has really, really good off season. So uh, we'll see. I mean, this is a wait-and-see game, guys. I mean, this is a wait-and-see game with Devontae Parker. Nobody, and I don't even care, don't even judge him on preseason, to be honest with you, until he gets into the regular season and starts playing well. That's the only... I'm not falling for this anymore, okay? I'm just not going to be... I'm just not going not gonna to do it. Alright, this next news story comes from Dolphins Wire. The Dolphins' defensive line has been dominant after the first five days. One of the primary storylines in the second week of Dolphins training camp is the play of their defensive line. During their early stages, their defensive line hasn't just dominated the Dolphins' offensive line. They've simply bullied them. This is a quote from defensive line coach, uh, our defensive line coach. He says, quote, I feel like they're doing the same thing every day, uh, and they've been out there. To, oh, this is from Adam Gates, excuse me. They're attacking. They're great. They have great penetration. They're coming off the edge with uh, the get-off is remarkable. Uh... He, our defensive line coach, he said, uh, Chris, our defensive line coach, has done a really good job of getting those guys for how hard they work individually. You wouldn't be able to tell that they got do individual, and they transfer to team drills because those guys just bring it. How they pressure the ball, get back on the line of scrimmage, go to the next play. There's a lot of energy exerted on one play, and they just move on to the next one. He has developed those guys. That's a tough group. They're really trending in the right direction. Now, on the one hand, and this is something we just talked about, but on the one hand, you're like, yes. And then on the other hand, you're like, dude, any any defensive line last year dominated our offensive line. Um, it's It was sad. I mean, even against the teams that we had good running uh, games against, they, there were plays in those games that were like, good lord. And if it wasn't for Kenyon Drake being as good as he was, it would have been even worse. Uh, I mean, he made so many people miss in the backfield. Every big run that he had. Um, like really big run that he had, he except against the Panthers. But other than that, all the other ones, he made somebody miss that was not blocked. So our offensive line was terrible last year. So this could be like, oh god, they didn't improve at all. Josh, 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 excuse me, Josh. I, if I say his name wrong again, Josh Sitton obviously hasn't gotten as many reps as some of these other guys. I don't know why that is. If somebody can tell me down in the comment section below, I've been sick for a very long time. That's why this episode didn't come up come out on Sunday so I'm not as well versed as I usually am on things so if somebody could tell me if there's a reason for that I think it's just probably because he's a vet if I had to guess but for whatever reason that is I don't know but 
God, if we have to deal with another year of Ted Larson, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have to deal with it. But again, th there's two sides of every coin. Either this is a really good sign or it's a really bad one. I really couldn't tell you. Uh, but again, this is this is a threat. This has happened before, uh, which is not a good sign. So it, as long as this clears up eventually with everybody coming back healthy, because uh, this offensive line, in my opinion, is talented. I mean, it's got talent on it. Um, we'll see. The only thing that concerns me is there's just a pattern from past seasons, past off seasons. That's all that concerns me. Uh, I can't tell me how many times I've heard this in the Dolphins offseason where the defense is, you know, giving it to the offense, especially since Adam Gase has been here. So, uh, yeah, I just hope that that's not something that we're going to have to go through again. Uh, and it's good to know that Tannehill, even with all of that, Tannehill's only throwing one pick, even though the offensive line is, you know, playing god-awful. Um, so, yeah. Not like they can sack him or anything. You, you know what I'm saying. But, like, you get pressured, you make a quick decision, it's picked off. You know what I'm trying to say. This next news story comes from Dolphins Wire. Dolphins running back Frank Gore continues to defy the odds. Frank Gore has played 13 seasons in the league, but he continues to play like a 25-year-old running back instead of a 35-year-old one. While the Dolphins aren't using Gore a lot during training camp practices, he has been impressive when he's had the ball in his hands. During Monday's practice, Gore pounded the f ball for a first down for about 15 yards. At an age where most players have retired from the running back position, Gore continues to defy the odds being a productive back. Last season for the Colts, Gore rushed for 961 yards and three touchdowns behind a questionable offensive line. Gore's play has even surprised quarterback Ryan Tannehill. When he Ryan said, quote, when he runs downhill, he puts his foot in the ground and he goes, Tannehill said after Monday's practice. Ryan said, quote, you can see it on tape, but to see it in person, you see a crease that's about a foot wide, barely able to get a helmet through, and somehow he fits his whole body through and gets off to the next level. They're probably... Uh, that's probably has been the most fun for me is just seeing him put his foot on the ground and go downhill and find a way through a crease where it looks like a human being can't fit. Uh, this is news that I wanted to bring up for a variety of different reasons. Number one, the thing that I'm most excited about is not, a, well, I'm super excited about Tannehill coming back, but the th I, to be honest with you, the thing I'm super, super excited about, probably more than anything, um, other than Tannehill, because I am super excited about that, but other than that, I think the funnest positional group that, out of all of them that are, other than the secondary problem, well, probably more than the secondary, because it's just more entertaining, inherently, is the, the backfield. I mean, this backfield is really, really talented. Um, I mean, it is really talented. Can you Drake, you know, is just a goon and a half. He, he comes from a different planet as far as I'm concerned. If you've ever seen a picture of um, him standing next to Frank, he, he looks he makes Frank look like crap and Bilbo Baggins, for God's sakes. People forget how big Kenyon is. Jacked, by the way. Dude's jacked. Uh, and Kalen. Kalen has been tearing it up so far in training camp. Tearing it up. I, don't, I couldn't find a story on it, but... Um, you know, look from things I've been reading and the interview that he did, and from what coaches have been saying, he has he has been playing very well so far in training camp. He's he's been busted off a couple uh, good runs here and there. So I'm super excited about this backfield. I think it's gonna be. I don't want to hype it up, or I, you know, obviously don't want to hype it up. But dude, it's got a chance, dude. It's got a chance to be the second best backfield we've ever had. Uh, I think it does have a chance. It could be as good, if not better than the Ronnie Brown, Ricky Williams backfield. It's never going to be better than the perfect backfield, obviously, but I think it's got a chance to be something super special, and I cannot wait to see these guys play uh, because there's not a doubt in my mind that these guys are going to dominate. And, you know, one thing I want to bring up before we move on, this is a, this is a layered story. Tannehill throughout his career, when he has a running game of any kind, and and he has won a lot of games without one, trust me, if you look at the stats. But when he has a running game, his record is ridiculous. It's like, it's well over 500. So if you just give my dude some help, he's going to win a lot of games for you. So if the if the running backs are as good as I... The only thing that could stand in their way is this offensive line. But I know these running backs are going to be really good. Like, really good. So I, this team, this offense has a chance, dude. As long as this offensive line doesn't mess it up and Josh doesn't get hurt. And, and, and if we can at least have him for at least 12 to 10 games... We're going to be okay, dude. This offense is going to be good. Uh, and it, it just gets me excited, dude. And I cannot wait to see Kalen play. But to have Frank Gore, Kenyon Drake, dude, we got to come up with a nickname for this backfield. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be very, very good. It's going to be very, very good. This next news story comes from Dolphins Wire. Dolphins quarterback Cordray Tankersley in tough battle to keep starting spot. 
there have okay here, here you go there has been a lot of good news leading into the 2018 NFL regular season for the Miami Dolphins secondary cornerback Xavier Howard has been hailed as the as a rising star and safety Minka Fitzpatrick has created excitement as a first rounder out of Alabama while these players have grabbed their share of focus and headlines this offseason there is an excellent storyline in Cordero Tankersley is trying to hold a starting spot uh, on the depth chart drafted in the third round Tinkersley started 11 games, posting 31 tackles and 7 pass defense. Uh, obviously, one of those was for the game winner against the Falcons. With his debut coming in London against the New Orleans Saints, despite turning in an exit performance to open his career, the young defensive back is far from guaranteed a starter. Uh, place a place as a starter. Four-year Dolphins veteran Tony Lippett and sophomore undrafted free agent Tony McTire are also making a case for the opportunity to be the man opposite Howard. Lippitt was a starter for, uh, f himself for 13 games of 2016, where he o not only led the team with four picks, but he also tied for 11th in the NFL with 11th past 11 pass defense. The following campaign, the former Michigan State Spartan was sidelined for the whole season because of a torn Achilles. That gave Tankersley the opportunity to shine. Tankersley showed respect for the reps offered to his competition in the position battle. Uh, when talking to her reporters, he said, Tinkersley said, quote, They're all, they all are well-deserved reps. Everybody is just going out there and competing, trying to get better. As far as Tory McTire getting first-team reps, it's well-deserved. So this is another multi demit Listen, man, this, this, this is like, uh, what does Shrek say? Something about layers. That's what we're talking about right now. This is layers, dude. This secondary has, a, we just talked about the backfield, this secondary has a chance to be something really special um, because we have all of this talent coming back. Torrey McTire is a young stud that we've continued to develop. He had a tremendous preseason. Him and Cordrea had a really good preseason, um, but Torrey is special. He's, he's a very big, he's a super athletic, tall, long corner, just like Tony. He's probably got a little bit more quickness to him, um, a little bit more athletic when, when you watch him play, but um, it, I'm... The fact that Tory's taking first team reps, plus we have TP coming off of that four pick season two two seasons ago. Xavier's playing really well. Minka Fitzpatrick, TJ. I mean, dude, this secondary is, is is really good. And Bobby McCain. It makes me really really excited, and it's it's good to hear that we have this much depth. And and, and to be honest with you, you can make an. I mean, secondaries are super important. If you and if we can marry that with a good defensive line, we'll have one of the best defenses in the NFL. I mean. Uh, obviously, but this secondary is going to be very, very good. The only thing that's standing in their way is um, the run game. As long as we don't get pounded uh, constantly throughout the season, we'll be the secondary is going to get a lot of turnovers. Let this secondary and this defensive line get in a lot of third and longs, and we're going to win a lot of games. And this defense is going to be very, very good. All right, let's see here. Trying to get to the next news story. This next news story comes from 24-7 Sports. Mike Gusecki has been a quick study for the Miami Dolphins. Combining the kind of physical tools Mike Gusecki showed during his NFL draft process with the mental work ethic described this summer, uh, and the Miami Dolphins should have high expectations for their rookie tight end out of Penn State. Media Dolphins... Uh, media and Dolphins camp describes Gusecki as a quick study, which was not immediately the case from working with Notre Dame's Durham Smythe in the playbook to whiteboard sessions with his family and friends. Gusecki showed up for training camp with a clear mental focus, according to special, uh, according to the media or the Dolphins media. Uh, Gusecki may enjoy. Okay, well, this is a stupid article. Yeah, this. The only reason I brought this up is because Mike has been uh, on his off time, really working on the playbook. He's drawn up plays on the whiteboard. He's had his family make sure he's right in terms of like it's like taking a test. He describes the play. Uh, they, you know, obviously, you know, tell him if he's right or wrong. Um, so yeah, he's a hard worker, which is great news. Um, and again, if he, apparently he knows the playbook, and if he combines that with his talent, dude, bro, we're we're, we're good to go. We're good to go. So Mike Isaki having a really good off season so far. Not a lot of complaints for me, that's for sure. From everything I'm hearing, and especially with these clips of him catching one-handed, if you guys, seriously, if you guys haven't seen it, go check it out. I mean, good, good lord, this man is a beautiful beast. Beautiful beast. We haven't had a tight end like this in, I, since Charles Clay, but I, he's, got, he's got a chance to be something like Jimmy Graham-level special. 
with his red zone ability. Uh, this next news story comes from Dolphins Wire. Dolphins players were chippy on the fifth day of Dolphins training camp. On Monday, the Miami Dolphins finally practiced in pads for the first time during this year's training camp. They also practiced in their inside facility because of the threat of lightning in the area. There were a couple of uh, fights. First, after cornerback Bobby McCain knocked down a pass thrown by Ryan Tannehill, he got into it with wide receiver Danny Amendola singing a few expletives as the two butted head helmets before they were separated. Not too long after that incident, McCain and Amendola shook hands and went their separate, separate ways. Uh, then later, wide receiver Jakeem Grant and Minka Fitzpatrick also got into, a, got into it on the far end of the field. Palm Beach post Joe Shad was able to see it. Jakeem Grant and Minka Fitzpatrick... Minka Fitzpatrick emerged from scrum, fired up, hard to tell who was swinging, but emotional moment at Miami Dolphins practice. Uh, uh, let's see here. And here's a couple of noteworthy things from Monday's practice. This was, this was yesterday. Uh, the Dolphins' defensive line overwhelmed the offensive line many times during practice. Defensive ends, this is with pads on, by the way. Defensive end Cameron Wake and Robert Quinn were consistently putting pressure on Ryan Tannehill for a better part of the day. Speaking of the Dolphins' offensive line, Ted Larson received the work with the first team at left guard. This was the second straight day Larson took some reps with the first team at left guard. Sam Young also received snaps at left tackle for Larry Tunsil on Monday. Uh, Taviz Kaloon, I don't know how the heck you say that name, intercepted or... Th- pass thrown by Brock Osweiler. Osweiler threw the pass as he was being pressured. So far during camp, Osweiler has thrown a number of interceptions during the... F- <laughs> dude, it's been five days. My dude's throwing multiple picks. Uh, center J- Sorry for the weird cut there. My audio had cut out, but we're on to the next next new story, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this next new story comes from Pro Football Talk. Dolphins offensive line coach says group not where it needs to be. Uh, this is from Jeremiah Washburn. The Dolphins' offensive line play has been problematic over the last few years, and the team's offensive line co- coach hasn't seen things come together as he hoped at this point in the calendar. Jeremy, Jeremiah Washburn said that he likes having starters set at all five positions, including uh, new left guard Josh Sitton, center Daniel Kilgore, but that's a cohesive unit that is not developing, quote, fast enough for his liking. Jeremiah Washburn said, quote, We're not where we need to be. He says, I think Adam Gase said the same thing Saturday. I do like the group. It's a good group of guys. They're working hard. But in terms of production, we're not where we need to be. uh, Protection, run game, we're just not. We're going to have to continue to work at it. I love Jeremiah Washburn. I think he's a great coach. I think he's one of the best coaches on our staff. Um, He's a tremendous coach. He got hit by a truck, apparently, and he's still coaching. He injured his leg. Again, this is concerning because it is a pattern of things that have happened in the past. But... Um, Jeremiah was here in 2016 when our offensive line had the big, put tape that we haven't we haven't seen and, it, and even when people got hurt when Sam Young came in I mean he, he really helped develop some of those those uh, backup players and he did a great job with that offensive line at that time um, so he's a great coach and I have a lot of faith in him that he's gonna get the job done but again it is a little concerning it is early but hopefully we get this stuff fixed um, as fast as possible and again if anybody can do it it's him he's a great coach so I don't think we should be too concerned uh, about the whole the whole situation here. Uh, this next year, I know you guys are probably well. We already talked about Mike Isaki, you know, catching a bunch of touchdowns on red zone drills. Uh, this next new story comes from the Miami Herald. Dolphins backup quarterbacks not good. Here's what the team will do. On the fifth day of training camp, Miami Dolphins reserve quarterback Brock Osweiler threw his fourth pick. Uh, this was one of this was to, was to first year quarterback. Uh, God, I cannot say his name. Tavis Calhoun, and there would have been another had linebacker Terrence uh, Garvin not stepped in front of a weak sideline throw and dropped it, preventing quarterback Cordray Tangersley, who was waiting for the pass that seemed to throw it to him before intercepting it. Osweiler had an up and down first week of training camp, and perhaps that's being kind because he was terrible the first day and not much better the final day before the Dolphins were given Tuesday off. Osweiler has been working primarily with the third string offense. Excuse me, while David Fields has taken most of the practice reps with the second stringers, Bryce Petty, the former New York Jet quarterback, has worked almost cons- exclusively with the fourth stringers. None of these guys have been great at practice. All have had shining moments, all have made cringe worthy plays, decisions, throws. It's not that starter Ryan Tannehill doesn't have any job security worries, it's that Dolphins should have backup quarterback worries. And yet they don't. No one is panicking and no one is even worried. I am told sources familiar with the teams thinking that the plan is 
to uh, is to pick either Fails or Osweiler as the team's backup. Petty is a distant third at this early point, remains unchanged. Yet the Dolphins will monitor the waiver wire for possibly a veteran quarterback upgrade when teams begin to trim their rosters in September. This sucks because I actually was like, oh, dude. David, and again, I told you guys this. this I mean, this is not news to me. You know what I'm saying? I, I told you that our backup quarterback situation is not good. Uh, but I was there was a part of me that was like, you know what, David Fails seems to be impressing a lot of people. Maybe there's a chance that, you know, he becomes something this preseason. He had a really good 2017 preseason. Uh, people seem to like what he did against the Bills, even though I didn't. I, thought, I didn't think it was that impressive at all. Um, but it does. it's disappointing to hear that, that he's not had a really good practice so far during training camp because I did have some high hopes for him uh, in terms of you know him being able to be a pretty dang good you know backup quarterback but it, it, apparently not true if if you are if you cannot decide between Brock Osweiler and somebody else stop right there just hit the brakes hit stop the bus that's when you know it's bad is when one of the worst quarterbacks I've ever seen definitely one of the worst quarterbacks that got paid in NFL history um when that happens, that's not a not a good thing for your franchise. Uh, I mean, Brock is terrible, and if the fact that they can't decide, okay, who's the backup, is not good, uh, and that disappoints me, because I I definitely thought David was better than that, uh, even though he still seems to have things on lockdown with you know with obviously the second stringers, but you know throwing five picks, you know, just like come on guys, like. Obviously, Matt Moore is no longer here. You know, I don't know. I don't know about no veteran court. I, I, I don't know. But it's not looking good. If, and again, if Tannehill got hurt anyway, this t- the, the season would be over. Uh, so it's not like, you know, whatever. But it would have been nice to have somebody who can sufficiently come in and, you know, be, you know, somebody who's at least ha- almost a game manager or could just manage a game at some level. But it doesn't seem to be that way. And it's that just, you know, it's disappointing. This next new story comes, it's at least so far, I mean, it is early, uh, and we'll see what happens in preseason, but yeah, you know what I'm saying. This is again, and you know what, I'm about to get on this, the, the, the training again, I don't want to, but this is why we should have drafted a backup quarterback. We should have given up some draft capital capital and future drafts and, cra- and just done it and got somebody who, who we can do. I mean, Luke Folk was sitting right there. The only reason he didn't get drafted... Uh, earlier is because of some he had some injuries and people were worried about since he was through so much at Washington uh that he was his shoulder was all jacked up that's the only reason he dropped so far other than that this guy's he was a first he was a day two talent dude but no of course we don't do that I mean my god dude, this is kind of so, this is what I'm talking about this would not be a problem right now if if um if we just did that I mean there were so many decent quarterbacks that we could have developed um, so I don't know it just, it's upsetting uh, this next news story it comes from the Miami Herald. Dolphins say they believe getting this player was a steal, and he's impressing in draft. That player is Isaiah Ford. There have been plenty of receivers who flash during summer practices, uh, then slide into obscurity, uh, from Ro- Roberto Wallace to Drew Morgan, still on the team, um, to Legadu Leg- Nene. Oh, God, that was a thing. There might be something different about Isaiah Ford, who ranks at the near top of Miami's most pleasant surprises over the past three months. The Dolphins' seventh-round pick in 2017, who missed all of last season because of a preseason knee injury, made an acrobatic catch in the end zone during Sunday's practice. Uh, One of a bunch of impressive receptions he made since the start of practices in May. And receiver coach Ben Johnson admitted Sunday that the Dolphins, quote, were shocked that he was still there in the seventh round. We felt that that uh, getting him was a steal when we got him in the first place. We liked him better than the seventh round. Isaiah Ford, who is six foot two, I, I forgot he was t- that tall, so I, he might actually be the second tallest. Who has been making a strong case for the Dolphins to keep him as the sixth receiver with Yante Crew among the Oh God, get out of here, Yante! I'm so sick and tired of him. Miami opened last season with five receivers on their roster. Ford, Ford fell in the draft partly because of his four six one forty time. Yeah, everybody thought he was a lot faster than that. If if he ran a fast forty, he would have been drafted way higher. Uh, since injuring a shoulder after a deep catch on Friday, Ford has been wearing a red jersey in practice, an indication to the defense that he shouldn't be roughed up. But Ford's good work the past two days have been primarily primary the, the byproduct of good hands and skilled route running. Ford caught 210 passes for oh, well over 2,000 yards, almost three, basically 3,000 yards. An average of 14 yards a catch, 24 touchdowns in three years at Virginia Tech. Uh, I love Isaiah Ford. I always have. 
Um, he's a really good player. He's a really good route runner too, and he's got great hands. And he had a lot of good red. He had really good red zone production in college, uh, and he is six foot two, so he's a big body guy. And again, we've had success drafting uh, later round receivers and turning them into really good pros. So I mean, you talk about I I, I, I can name a ton of them right now. Um, so. This makes me excited. I hope he can keep this up consistently. Hopefully, he does not get hurt. It seems to me that he he definitely you know so, so some people do they just they have glass for bodies. Uh, it, it's it's unfortunate. Um, hopefully, he can stay healthy uh, is the hope because you know it never hurts to have a six foot two beast of a receiver. It, it, it never who's a great route runner, especially for somebody that big. Um, Usually, obviously, it's you know five ten, five nine, five eight guys who can run routes. But you know, um, this makes me excited. I'm excited to see what he can do. Um, this off season, um, there's a big spider that just dropped down and distracted me a little bit. Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm super excited about this. Um, cannot wait for my dude Isaiah Ford. Uh, a lot of exciting things. Minka Fitzpatrick. I mean, there's so many exciting. Um, news and you know i feel like people are sleeping on minka i guess people just expect it from him uh but dude he's having a so he's having a really good camp and we haven't had that from a first round pick in a very long time so i he needs to get more reg like seriously it's making me upset this rookie class is really good uh so far it has been minka who's play just apparently i mean people he's so good people just don't even talk about it um Mike Gusecki, who who's having a very good camp for a rookie tight end, catching touchdowns like I mean I just unbelievable touchdowns, um, and uh, Kalen Balaj, who's had a tremendous camp so far. So this is this is making me uh, or off season. This is very exciting, um, very very exciting. Not to mention the young players in the secondary. So yeah, this is super exciting. I can't wait to see these players play. Um, a lot of talent on this roster. Uh, and it makes me excited. Uh, in case you guys, again, the reason I didn't upload on Sunday or Monday is I was sick and uh, I had a bout, man. It was it was a, it was an all out drag out war with diarrhea and throwing up. It, it was really bad. I mean, talking hot squirt fire just coming out of you, out of every orifice on your body. It was disgusting, guys. It was it was a it was a battle. But you know what? We're better now. Um, that's the reason I couldn't get the fan Q and A up. I'm the fan Q and A will be up, and I appreciate everybody who comments. I've seen some salty sallies who have been like, listen, man, uh, you know, I, I don't care how many questions you ask. It doesn't, it's not like, it's not a jab at you. I really appreciate it. But, you know, I'm trying to get everybody, you know, I don't want to get everybody's question. And, 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 and if we have time, we're going to answer every, every single question. But that's the only reason I said that. I love the community on this channel. We have a great one, probably the best on YouTube. Uh, and I'm Skyx83, and I will see you guys in the next one.